Hey there, everyone. It's Kelly here. Today, we've got something a little different for you. I'm introing right now a video class that I'm going to be sharing in full that will follow this uh, immediately. And this is a class that I taught a few years ago, which is a really deep dive onto applying and separating aspects. It was part of a summit that I presented in uh, for Astrology University. And if you've been hearing these words about applying or separating aspects and you're not sure what they mean or how they influence the way you interpret an aspect in your birth chart, then the upcoming class is for you. So what we're going to do is uh, review orbs in this uh, class and orbs for aspects. And then we're going to go into what is an applying aspect? What is a separating aspect? What might it mean? And when in your life might it be most influential? So this is a deep dive class on aspects in the birth chart, looking specifically at differences between applying versus separating aspects. So if that's something you would like to know more about, sit back, relax, get comfortable and enjoy the class. And of course, if you're enjoying my videos here on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to my channel and hit like on the video below. Or if you have a question or comment about the uh, uh, training material, let me know in the comments below. All right. Enjoy. Talk to you soon. Well, hello, friends. I'm really happy to have Kelly Surtees here to give you this presentation from bad to good, moving beyond the limitations of your aspects. Really glad to have you joining us at this summit, and I will turn it over to Kelly. Thanks for joining us, Kelly. Thanks so much, Tony, and thanks everyone for joining us on this special weekend event. Uh, Tony, we're also blessed to have you and Astrology University doing such a great job providing these fabulous events for us all. Thanks, Kelly. So I want to talk today about this idea we have in aspect theory that has to do with movement and the idea of life or the living essence in the chart, which we see through the application and separation of aspects. And I know that sounds a little bit technical, but I'm hoping to break this down for you today in a way that seems pretty accessible and that you can take away and use in your practice right away. I'm gonna show you the theory and then I'm gonna take you through some charts where we can see how, it's almost like how a bad aspect becomes a good aspect uh, or how a difficult aspect is restricted to influencing you at a particular point in time in your life. So there are ways that some of the more problematic aspects or at least aspects that look problematic can begin to work in our favor over time. So as we're getting started, I wanted to do a very brief recap on aspects themselves. One of the big key points that I was taught in the beginning of my astrology career is that aspects show action. And when we're interpreting a birth chart, we're always wanting to know where the action is, aren't we? It's what you want to know, it's what your clients want to know, what your friends and what your family want to know. So working with aspects is really the most important thing you'll ever do in your astrological career. <clears throat> the better you know aspects and the better you understand how the planets work in an aspect, the deeper and the more insightful your interpretations can be. So one quote that I love for aspects is this quote by Plato, which says, thinking, the talking of the soul with itself. And somehow that speaks to me about aspects in terms of both our internal dialogue, in terms of our thoughts and our reflections, but also in the way we internally process the things around us. One of the confusing things about aspects, when I teach aspects to my students, they wonder is, you know, are aspects telling me what's going on in my mind or what's going on outside in my life at large? And in fact, aspects show both. They can tell us about your internal landscape and they can also, also de describe events and topics and people or circumstances in your life and in the environment around you. So we're going to talk about some of those manifestations, both internal and external manifestations of aspects today. I wanted to clarify as we're getting started, just so we're all on the same page, that when I work with aspects, I just use the five original Ptolemaic aspects. Now, these aspects are created on the concept of sight or sight lines. And so these five aspects, if you need a quick refresher, include the conjunction aspect, which is the zero degree aspect, 
the sextile aspect, which is 60 degrees, the square aspect, uh, which you see in the blue arrow, the sextile, of course, would be described by the, uh, sorry, blue is sextile, squares would be red, and then the green uh, triangle or aspect here is showing us the trine, the 120 degree aspect, and the yellow arrow is going to describe the opposition, the 180 degree aspect. The conjunction, of course, is when two planets are very close to each other, so we'd see that here, if you like. Now, these sight lines indicate planets that exchange energy. And the traditional theories about aspects show that you have to see each other to interact and influence each other. So there are some modern aspects that you might be familiar with that I won't be using in this presentation today. And they include things like the semi-sextile and the quincunx or the inconjunct. So if you use them in your practice, that's totally fine. You might find for this idea about movement and application and separation of aspects that working with just these five aspects is the best way to go for this particular approach. So I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page about that as we're getting started. <clears throat> Another question that comes up a lot, of course, about aspects is orbs. And the orbs vary and they have varied throughout history. So the fact that no astrologer today in modern 21st century practice can tell you exactly what orb um, that you should use because we all sort of have our own preference. That's an argument that astrologers have been having throughout the ages. So back in the ancient Hellenistic tradition, aspects within a three degree orb were considered to be the most powerful, although they did allow more space for aspects involving the moon as a faster moving planet. In the medieval period, orbs were actually connected to planets, not to the aspects themselves. For instance, if you had an aspect involving Saturn or Jupiter, you might use a nine degree orb. And if you had an aspect involving the sun, you might use a 15 or up to a 17 degree orb. So I know it can be confusing. And the general rule that I go by is a little bit larger orb for an applying aspect and a little bit tighter or smaller orb for a separating aspect. And I'll clarify that a little bit more as we go. Uh, so just to give you an idea that we're sort of working with something between, you know, Within a three degree orb is gonna be very tight, whether it's applying or separating. And then anything from three to about 15 degrees could be relevant depending on the planets and the other criteria involved. So when you start considering this idea of movement, we're looking at the planets moving towards or moving away from each other. It does feel a little bit more detailed, but certainly a lot more nuanced. So you will get more depth and I believe more accuracy out of your aspect work this way. One final um, kind of basic foundation point on aspects to put out as we're getting started. And this is the idea that you do have a certain type of aspect that will be more dramatic or more powerful. And they tend to be aspects where one of the planets is one of the faster moving planets, like the Moon, Sun, Mercury, Venus, or Mars. And the other planet in the aspect is one of the slower moving planets, particularly Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, or Pluto. So when there's sort of an inner and an outer planet forming an aspect, it does tend to describe some, something a little more dramatic or significant in your life. So these are our general aspect guidelines as we're getting started. And what I'd like to do now is to show you these in action, but also introduce this idea of movement. So when we're talking about applying and separating aspects, the terms themselves might be somewhat self-explanatory until you think about it in the chart. So I wanna break it down for you. An applying aspect is simply an aspect that is getting stronger where the faster of the two planets in the aspect is moving towards the slower planet. In a separating aspect, the definition of that is that the faster of the two planets in an aspect is moving away from the slower planet. So straight away that begs the question, how do I know which planet's faster and which planet's slower? And this is where we do need to review our ideas and understanding of movement. So when we're talking about an applying aspect, we're talking about two planets and therefore <clears throat> two areas of life or even two psychological dynamics that are pulling together or coming together and being reinforced. 
when we're talking about a separating aspect, we're talking about two planets that are pulling apart or moving away from each other. And it's probably not a big leap from that idea to understand that when two planets are moving together, there is this intensity or this sort of um, strength to their bond. Whereas when two planets are pulling apart, it describes something that is lessening its hold or influence on you. So what we're essentially attempting to do here is reanimate the birth chart to remember that the birth chart, even though we look at it as a printed two-dimensional flat thing, that it actually describes this living three-dimensional model of the cosmos. And to do that, we do have to kind of go back into that idea that the planets are moving and that the birth chart is a photograph, a freeze frame. It's like you've all been playing... Um, musical chairs and everybody has been moving around the room and somebody's just said freeze and we take the snapshot and that's the birth chart. But if we didn't interrupt that movement, everybody was mid motion, if you like. And so the idea here is we do need to determine, and this will be your biggest bit of personal reflection, homework or takeaway after today, is to figure out in your chart which planets are moving towards which other planets and which planets might be moving away from which other planets. I'm going to tell you why this is so important in a moment and we will go through a detailed example together. But the idea, the concept we're working with is to bring that breath of life and to reanimate the chart, almost like pouring water on something that's been a bit dry and seeing what comes to life really easily or what has already run its course and doesn't come back to life. And I've used this image here. I always like to tell the story of the idea of people at a party, if you like. You know, we've all been to a party where there are people you want to see and you kind of make a beeline towards them. You are, in essence, acting as an applying planet in that scenario. You've got your sights <coughs> on someone you want to interact with and you're heading over to them. If you get there easily and quickly, you might be applying to them via a sextile or a trine. If you get distracted, you're on your way to them and you realize I've got to run to the loo or somebody else interrupts you and you have to get out of that conversation so you can get to the person you're desperately trying to connect with. That might be like applying via a square or an opposition where you're going to get there, but there might be a little bit of a delay or a little bit of a tangent before you make contact with the person you're trying to interact with. Then we've also, I imagine, I'm sure you've all been in a party where you've been cornered by someone that you don't want to talk to. And what you're trying to do is perhaps be polite, but to somehow exit that conversation. And that's you acting as a planet that might be separating from an asset. You're engaged in that conversation, but you're really thinking, oh my gosh, this person is, is quite boring, or I'm busting for a pee, I need to get out of here, or maybe you're thirsty and you need to get a drink. <clears throat> so when you're, you as the planet, if you like, was the person trying to remove yourself, that's a separation, a separating aspect of pulling away. And you might be pulling away, maybe you get away easily. It's, you come up with a quick, um, very sort of socially acceptable um, way to excuse yourself. And that could be a separating aspect. That's a sextile or a trine. Or maybe you've got to stay there and listen to them finish their story or they're talking about something you really disagree with. But eventually you work your way out of the conversation. And that might be separating via, via a square or an opposition. You might be noticing my language here too. In traditional astrology, we don't necessarily consider aspects quite as black and white in terms of good or bad as they are considered in modern astrology. In traditional astrology, we say that an aspect is better than no aspect. To have sight and energy exchange or interaction shows we're going to have activity. Something's going to be happening. And so we will take a square or an opposition aspect over no aspect at all. In most cases, there might be some exceptions, but for most cases. So even to have you know, a square or an opposition is not necessarily a bad thing. It'll really depend on how the planets are speaking to each other. 
Another way of thinking about it to really use our party analogy is if you're, if you're involved in a um, pleasant conversation at the party, you're really fascinated by what the other person is telling you or they share the same love of the same type of chocolate that you do, which sometimes happens to me, that's a conversation or an interaction that might be described by a sextile or a trine. And maybe you're in an interaction where you think, I do have to talk to this person, it's the right thing to do, or I've been meaning to contact them and haven't got around to it, and now I need to sort of apologise for being a bit slack. Those conversations can still be important and productive, even if they might be more described by that sort of frustration or extra effort of the square and the opposition. So the idea here, imagine the planets in your chart as people at a party and we're looking to see who's moving towards who and who's moving away from who. And in this little picture here on the screen, of course, you can sort of see, um, you know, this gentleman is maybe trying to catch the eye of someone over here, may or may not be um, having a good uh, luck with that. These two people have clearly got maybe a sextile going on here. Um, this fellow is just talking to himself, so he might be a planet not in aspect. Um, and this person is sort of discussing over here with this person. So you can just sort of see the different lines of energy that are going on. And that's the, one of the simplest ways to think about aspects in your birth chart is to think about it as lines of energy. <clears throat> So I wanted to get a chart up so I can start showing you, I know this concept is very abstract until you see it in play. And I know our intention with this summit is actually to give you stories of inspiration. Um, so most of my other chart examples are showing you how these aspects will take you beyond maybe some difficulties in your early life. This first example is an, ex is an example of a separating aspect that delivered something very positive to this person early in their life. And I wanted to use it to help reinforce the idea that separating aspects tend to manifest more strongly earlier in our life. Now, in the case of Emma Watson, she has a very good um, or functional separating aspect. And it might be the kind of aspect she would have liked to be applying so she could continue to get more out of it over the course of her life. But for many of us, we actually have some difficult aspects in our chart that are separating. And that could be something like the moon square Mars or the moon opposite Saturn. And what that difficult aspect, when it's separating shows, it typically describes some pain from childhood or your early life, potentially teenage years or early 20s. But it's usually our younger years when we don't have as much agency or control over our lives. And so the idea of that separating aspect when it's problematic, it tends to show that the most difficult issue of that aspect will have manifested when you were young. And as you get older, you sort of move out of whatever problems that aspect might have shown. Now, in Emma Watson's case, as I said, she might have wanted this aspect to continue. But let's really flesh out this idea of applying versus separating going to look at her Venus, which is in the sign of Pisces. I do use the whole sign chart format. So if you're just a little thinking this chart looks different from some of the charts you're used to seeing, that will be why. In this system, one of the things we do is we really link planets to topics based on their rulership of the houses. So Venus here ruling the second house where Emma has the sign of Libra, one of Venus's signs. Venus is really the money maker for her. And it's quite beautifully placed in its exaltation sign of Pisces in the very functional angular seventh house. So we might say she has a really good or functional ruler of the second house. So that's, it's off to a great start anyway. But even more than that, this Venus is involved in a very supportive, helpful aspect with Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is in pretty good condition himself in the sign of Cancer where it's exalted and in the 11th house, which is Jupiter's favorite house in the, in the whole chart and certainly the house in the chart known as the luckiest house. So the trick we've got, and this is how you break it down in terms of is this aspect applying or separating. First, identify the aspect itself. It's Venus trine Jupiter. Then we have to think about which planet is going to be faster or slower. And I'm going to give you a couple of resources to help you determine this on the next slide. However, so far I want to tell you that... <coughs> 
mostly the inner planets are known as faster moving planets as well. And nine times out of 10, Venus is going to be the faster moving planet when she's in an aspect with Jupiter. So it's a safe bet, unless Venus is maybe stationing retrograde or stationing direct, it's a safe bet that out of Venus and Jupiter, Venus will be the faster moving planet. So what that's telling us is we need to track Venus's movement through the chart to see whether she's getting closer to Jupiter or pulling away from Jupiter. So we look at the degrees to do that. Venus is at eight Pisces and Jupiter is at four Cancer. So the exact aspect would have occurred at the degree of the slower moving planet, which is in this case, Jupiter at four Cancer. So then we have to think, as is Venus at eight Pisces? Has she already moved through four Pisces or is she coming up to that? And if you're following along at home, you can see she's already moved through because if she's at eight Pisces, it means the day before she was at seven Pisces, the day before that she was at six Pisces, the day before that she was at five Pisces and the day before that, a full four days before Emma was born, Venus was back at four Pisces. And so that's when the, that exact peak strength, peak energy Venus trine aspect occurred. But this is why orbs and this is why movement are important. What this is, what a separating aspect is telling us is that the aspect peaked before the person was born. And it's like you're catching the wisp or the smell of something on the breeze. You know, when you come home at the end of the day and when you were young and your parents have maybe been cooking or you come home if you live with a partner or a flatmate <clears throat> and you can smell what's been made in the kitchen. And sometimes you think, oh my God, that smells amazing. I hope there's some left for me. And they're like, no, no, I just made enough for me or we just finished the last of it. I'm so sorry. And you're like, damn, I missed out. It's catching that whiff of something. Now, the planets are a little stronger than just catching the others. And so Venus does catch what Jupiter has thrown her, but she will do that early in life. Now, a Venus trine Jupiter aspect like this, a Venus trine Jupiter aspect is going to be very good for Venus things and Jupiter things, one of which in this chart is money. <clears throat> money because Venus rules the second house of Libra and because Jupiter is traditionally a planet of wealth. Because it's separating, our interpretive statement is you perhaps had an opportunity to receive or earn a lot of money very early in your life. And that, of course, rings true for Emma Watson, the actress who played Hermione in the Harry Potter films. She was cast in this role before she was 10, and she spent most of her teenage years working in this very, very successful global kind of movie sensation, uh, you know, or the series of the Harry Potter films. The reason I cottoned on to this example for Emma is that she gave an interview uh, when she turned 18, and she said, let's be honest, I never need to work for money again. And after being a little bit jealous, no, um, it's sort of a very uh, luxurious thing, isn't it? But the astrologer in me almost immediately got curious and was like, how, what, what's in her chart that, you know, she can just get to this place where she's so financially stable off her own bat. She didn't inherit the money. She doesn't come from a family of money. Um, she came from a stable middle-class family. It wasn't as though she started in absolute you know, poverty, but she went from middle-class to extremely wealthy um, within 20 years of being born. And this separating aspect is an example of if she can catch that opportunity early in life, she can get the best out of it. Now, when we've got a difficult, difficult aspect that's separating, we don't really want to catch it, but unfortunately it often um, affects us. And we're going to see some examples of that coming up very soon. But hopefully that's giving you a sense of how to work the degrees and, and do the faster, slower planet to do the applying versus separating. <clears throat> So here's a table that is just a very simple visual, but what I'm doing here is essentially trying to articulate for you the speed of the planets. The moon is always the fastest planet. And then the next three planets down on this left-hand column, Mercury, Venus, and the sun, they usually move about the same speed, close to one degree a day. Now the sun is steady and consistent, uh, very similar to the moon. The moon moves uh, between 11 and 15 degrees a day and the sun about one degree a day. 
So the sun and moon don't move at the same speed, but they don't go retrograde. That's what I mean by they have their individual rates of movement or speed, the moon obviously being much faster than the sun, but they tend to stick with that. Mercury and Venus do vary because, of course, they can go retrograde, just like Mars as well. And so Mercury, Venus and Mars can be very slow, zero degrees a day if they're stationing, but they can also be a fair bit faster. When Mercury is moving very quickly, he can be going as fast as two degrees a day. Venus can go up to, oh, off the top of my head, about 120. And Mars's top speed is slower than the sun. Mars tends to only go about 45 minutes a day. So the reason that you'll want to memorize this and start thinking about these numbers is that if you see the moon and Mars in an aspect, you will instantly know the moon's going to be the faster planet and you can use the moon's degrees in relation to Mars's degrees to work out whether it's applying or separating. Now, in the terms of the planets on the left-hand side, the, moon, the column starting with the moon, all of these planets here, and that's sort of our purple arrow, which I'm just emphasizing in pink, all of the planets on that left-hand side of this diagram will move faster than the planets on the right-hand side of the diagram in the column starting with Jupiter. So if you ever see Venus in aspect to Jupiter or Saturn, you'll know she will be the faster and therefore she's the planet that's either going to apply or separate from those aspects. So I know it can be a little tricky if you haven't thought about the planets in terms of movement and speed, but it's one of my personal missions in astrology is to help reanimate the chart and to help us all think about the chart as a moving, living, continuously in motion thing, because that's what's kind of going on inside your psyche. So for those of you who like lists and numbers, here is the hard data on slide 11, where I've actually spelled out the speed of the planets, uh, you know, the moon is considered fast when she's moving more than 13 degrees, 13 minutes a day and slow when she's below 12 degrees, 30 minutes a day. And then I've got the numbers there. There's zero, zero degrees, five minutes for Saturn. He's a very slow mover even when he's considered fast. But most of the time, if you see Mercury in aspect to Jupiter or Saturn, Mercury is going to be the faster moving planet. If Venus is in aspect or Mars is in aspect to Jupiter or Saturn, they'll be moving more quickly. The outer planets do move very slowly and every other planet in aspect to them will be moving more quickly. So even if you see a Jupiter-Uranus aspect, Jupiter is going to be moving faster than Uranus. So if you're sort of like, what's the order? Except for a retrograde of Mercury, Venus and Mars, the moon is the fastest planet all the way down here. The Mars is slower than all the planets above it, but Mars is faster than the planets on this side. Jupiter is the faster of the slow moving planets and so on down here to the outer planets, which will be the slowest of all the planets that are there. So let's keep working through some examples so you can see this in action. Now, how do you figure out the speed of the planet in your birth chart if you want to do that? You can grab your ephemeris and subtract the planet's place in the zodiac on the day after you were born from on the day that you were born. Software programs like Solify will also calculate this for you. But unless you know that Mercury, Venus or Mars are retrograde within a week or two of your birth, you can pretty much use this list that I've put together on slide 10 for you. So the interpretive theories that we're working for, for through here is the idea that a separating aspect tends to describe issues or themes that are strong when you're young or in your childhood. And the potential is that we grow out of or away from them. Now, in the case of Emma Watson, she had a good separating aspect and she may not have wanted to grow out of that. But what I tend to see in client practice are some more difficult aspects um, like Moon Uranus or Moon Pluto or Mars Saturn or even Mars Uranus uh, or Moon Mars even. Like, that's quite a difficult aspect that often gets overlooked when we're focused on the outer planet aspects. So if you see some of those types of aspects and they're separating, they're a very good clue of some very difficult experiences in a person's childhood. But they also tell us that those real issues, those real, um, whether it's trauma or abuse or however difficultly those aspects manifested, that they are also limited to childhood. 
Now, for most of my clients with difficult aspects, um, they do tend to manifest um, before the age of 10. Some, the, as the, the difficult separating aspect continues to manifest through the teen years. But I would, I, I hate drawing a hard and fast rule, but certainly by the time of the Saturn Square in the early 20s, the bulk of any problem from a difficult separating aspect has been done. And at the very end of the stretch, sometimes we'll see issues in the 20s, but by the time we have the first Saturn return, any problems indicated by separating aspects tend to be um, dispersed with. Like we've done it, we've had the difficult experience, we're now on the road to healing. Applying aspects are different. They are gonna be re-emphasized throughout life. Um, they have this kind of cyclical, repetitive theme. So your applying aspects can be major life themes that you return to and that get reactivated throughout your life. The idea with an applying aspect is that you're going to move from a more difficult to a more productive expression of that aspect. And so even if you have an applying aspect involving say Saturn or Mars or Uranus or Pluto, you will still see the more difficult manifestations of those aspects in childhood. And over time, as you get familiar with working with that aspect, you will kind of naturally, but also with your own effort, be able to use that planet in a more productive way or the, the aspect in a more productive way. And as we go through our examples today, these are some of the things that I wanna show you in action. So we've covered off all the theory that I wanted to um, get across to you today. And now I wanna show you how this works. So our first example is going to be Mayor Angelou, uh, who is, Oh, just such an inspirational person and whose chart I have long studied and admired. Now, there are four main aspects that I want to mention. And this chart will take a little bit of a deeper look at. So we'll spend a few minutes here and then we'll cycle through some other examples a little more quickly. So you may or may not know, you may know Maya as a uh, celebrated uh, writer and poet, uh, but she is someone who came from very impoverished uh, background and actually from a very difficult childhood. So um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of backstory and I, I don't wanna trigger anyone, but I, I do need to sort of talk about some of her life events so I can show you in the chart. So unfortunately, Maya um, very tragically was raped as a child by uh, a man, I believe it was one of her mum's boyfriends. Um, and she took a long time to speak about what happened. But when she did, the man who was a rapist was killed within 24 hours, basically. Because even though she was from a very difficult um, set of circumstances, there was this extended family that rallied on her behalf. And after that, she became mute. She felt that speaking out about her rapist had triggered for him to be killed. So she thought that it was her fault. So I thought that was really interesting. I'm like, this is a woman who becomes known for her writing and her speech, but she spent years as a child. She did not speak. She was absolutely mute. She had spoken up until the age of, I think she was about nine, but it could have been seven. She was quite young, unfortunately, when she was abused. Uh, and then, so she had fully formed <clears throat> speech and then she just stopped talking. And so when you get into her chart, one of the aspects that I think describes this is Mercury square Saturn. <clears throat> so she has Mercury in Pisces and she has Saturn in Sagittarius. And I wondered about, uh, so we're talking sort of about the speech response, if you like, to the childhood trauma. We'll talk a little bit more about the childhood trauma in a moment. So Mercury square Saturn can certainly describe someone who is very cautious or very thoughtful in both their speech and writing. And Mercury square Saturn can describe someone who might be insecure about not being smart enough. Uh, and sometimes that's a limitation to the person expressing their ideas. Thankfully not in Maya's case uh, in the end. But Mercury we can see at 20 degrees Pisces and Saturn at 19 Sag. So this technically, have a guess, do you think this is applying or separating? Mercury is gonna be the faster of the two planets here and he's at 20 degrees Pisces already. So that's our clue that this is a separating aspect because if Mercury is already at 20 Pisces, he had to move through 19 Pisces to make that square to Saturn. 
So Maya was born essentially a day after the Mercury square Saturn aspect heat. And so what we have here is some issues around language or communication that are likely to be prevalent in childhood or even her teenage years that she can move beyond as she gets older. And so the example of someone who becomes famous for her writing as, as an adult, um, you know, her book, Why I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, the first of her sort of five memoirs, along with her poetry and her plays, you know, she was an incredibly successful decorated writer. But we can see that um, squashing of that in childhood, if you like, through this separating aspect. That there's a concern, there might, there might be some Saturn limitations to communication, but because it's a separating aspect, we know that she will be able to rise above that as she gets older. So that's one of the aspects here. Now, another aspect that's quite difficult in Maya's chart is this Mars opposite Neptune aspect. Well, we can see Mars is at 27 degrees of Aquarius and Neptune is at 26 degrees of Leo. Now, this aspect becomes important in her chart for a number of reasons. One, because it sits right across the ascendant descendant axis. And in the whole sign chart, the ascendant is marked by the letters AS and the descendant by the letters DS. And so you can see the ascendant descendant axis is 23 Leo to 23 Aquarius. And the Mars Neptune opposition sits within five degrees of either ends of that ascendant descendant axis. So that makes the aspect more prominent and more descriptive. Because Maya Angelou is a daytime chart, there's a theory in ancient astrology Hellenistic astrology specifically, where in a daytime chart, Mars can be the planet that describes some of the most problematic things we go through. Because in a daytime chart, Mars gets a special designation known as the out of sect or contrary to sect malefic. And that means we're likely to see some more disruptive manifestations of Mars aspects in a daytime chart. In a nighttime chart, Saturn takes on that out of sect or contrary to sect malefic designation. And so in nighttime chart, we can see some more problematic manifestations out of Saturn aspects. So here for Maya, again, we've got to figure out, is this applying or separating? Um, Mars is obviously, well, not obviously, but just so to clarify, Mars will be the faster moving planet. Uh, Neptune, of course, being one of the outer planets, he's going to be the slower moving planet. Mars is at 27 Aquarius and Neptune is at 26 Leo. So here we definitely have a separation. Mars has already been, the day before, was at 26 Aquarius, so it is starting to pull away. Now, Mars can, of course, speak about um, anger or rage. It can talk about um, sexual experiences. And because we've got Mars in a day chart, we're potentially getting some more difficulties to do with that. With Mars-Neptune, we might get difficulties specifically to do with a lack of boundaries uh, or a lack of safety, lack of safe space. Compounding this sort of difficult aspect here is that Mars traditionally would be considered the ruling planet of the fourth house where Maya Angelou has Scorpio on her IC. So Mars directly speaks to her childhood or to her upbringing. And to have Mars in this difficult opposition to Neptune, it certainly would describe her very transient childhood. You know, she was with her mum for a while, and then with her grandmother for a while, and then with other family for a while. She moved around so much, long distances, partway across the country and back again, never really having any stability or safety. And of course, having this horrific um, sexual abuse rape situation as well. So that's horrible to have but the thing that would give you if you like a little hope if you were working with this client astrologically is that over time the energy whatever problems are indicated by this Mars opposite Neptune aspect we're going to see them reducing in intensity severity and frequency so moving beyond the childhood experiences there might be some issues in her 20s with falling for romantic partners where you kind of fall for the dream. You know, the Neptune, I just want to be in love or I thought they were perfect and then I found out that they weren't. But over time and with age and experience, there would be some clarity that would come into this quite foggy aspect. So that's the second aspect that I wanted to mention here for Maya Angelou. The next one I want to highlight is the Sun square Pluto. 
This is an aspect that would be known as a partile aspect, where the aspect is exact within the same degree. And this is the sun at 14 degrees, 48 minutes of Aries, in, and in a square aspect to Pluto at 14 degrees, 59 minutes in Cancer. So technically this is applying if we get very Virgo and straight down to the minutes here, but because it's within that part hole, you know, the sun's at 14, Pluto's at 14, that indicates this is likely to be an aspect, even if it was technically separating, that is going to highlight themes that Maya will revisit and explore throughout her life. Sun square Pluto is going to highlight themes around power what it means to have power, what it means to not have power, what it means to give power away, what it means to lose power, and how one might go about reclaiming power. Now we can see there were certainly uh, some difficult examples in Maya's childhood of not having had power or agency over her life, over her body, over her circumstances. Uh, not to say necessarily that this aspect caused the rape or what have you, but we can certainly see the thread here of the journey from being disempowered into the journey of empowerment, which is really the journey of any major Pluto aspect. For you to start your life in a set of circumstances or experiences where you don't have power or control and that that impacts you quite greatly and quite sharply and quite strongly to the extent that you actually fight, that you fight for your own power and that you fight for the power of others like you or others in your similar situations to you or to what you experienced. And we can see that Maya, through particularly some of her poetry, um, there's a beautiful poem called Still I Rise, where she talks about just getting back up and moving forward and recovery, that idea of never letting anything defeat you. And I think we see some of the strength coming through in this Sun Pluto aspect. So that the one aspect can have more difficult manifestations when we're young and lead us to a strength or a skill that we can draw on in quite a profound way as we age. Now, the Sun-Pluto aspect is a little more significant in Maya's chart for a couple of reasons. She has a Leo ascendant, and so the Sun there is the ascendant ruling planet, and that means that this aspect, any aspect to the Sun, becomes super important in describing her life as a whole. So that journey around power and control and there's the kind of struggle to reclaim power or to have power is kind of embedded there as one of the main sort of themes or threads for this life. Now, another aspect that might be all too easy to overlook, but I want to explicitly state it here, is the Mercury conjunct Venus aspect. So here we have to try and figure out two quicker moving planets, which is going to be applying to the other. Now, Mercury has the capacity to move faster than Venus. We just need to check where Mercury is in its cycle. And I checked, um, of course, I prepared this earlier. Mercury is moving about half a degree faster a day uh, than Venus at this particular point uh, in its cycle. And so this Mercury-Venus aspect is an applying aspect where Mercury is going to come up and almost sort of climb over the top of Venus and keep moving forward. And that means the energy of whatever Mercury and Venus indicates is going to be something that's reinforced and repeated and reactivated throughout Maya's life. Now, Mercury and Venus aspects, and in traditional astrology, there's only two types of aspects we can have between Mercury and Venus. We can have the conjunction or we can have the sextile. Either of those aspects is an indicator of artistic and creative talent. In the sign of Pisces, we might talk about somebody who is connected to music or to rhythm in some way. Because we've got the planet Mercury involved, we're definitely going to have a words and ideas piece. And with Venus here, we're going to have something that's either beautiful or very eloquent and eloquent or eloquent and elegant or even poetic. Water tends to be a little more poetry, if you like. It's not hard data, um, like perhaps earth or fire signs might be. The Mercury conjunct Venus here does speak, I believe, to her writing talent and her writing skill. Remember that what Venus does is she makes things more palatable. She makes things pleasant. We want more of it. Now, this conjunction's in the eighth house in Maya's chart. Her writing and her ideas and her poetry don't necessarily speak to happy topics. They speak to eighth house topics in that they speak of 
trauma or abuse or imprisonment or being held down. They speak to things that cause people fear or worry. You know, that eighth house has that much deeper psychological, we've got to get into the truths about things, even if they're difficult to swallow. And I think one of the gifts of this particular applying aspect in Maya's chart is that she can speak so beautifully about some of the deeper struggles of her, of her race, of women from her time in such a way that we actually want to hear what she has to say. And so I think that's a real um, indicator. It's a very simple aspect. We'd overlook it because we'd focus on the outer planet aspects. But some of these personal planet aspects are so critical to defining our identity and even some of our talents, how we can rise above things. So Maya Angelou's chart is a great example, like many of our charts, where we have some aspects that are very difficult and indicate quite tragic circumstances in our early lives. But even within those difficult aspects, there can be ways to rise above or move beyond whatever the trauma of the past might be. And in addition to some of those difficult aspects, we may also have some helpful aspects. Um, the Mercury Venus I've chosen to focus on today, but the other helpful and applying aspect in Maya's chart is that the sun does move to conjunct Jupiter. And that does help the sun out quite a lot in terms of lifting it up, helping it rise above as well. So that's one of my favorite examples, just to illustrate these general concepts and also to show you how in the one chart we're going to have a mix of applying and separating and how they'll come through. Now, some of the more challenging aspects, and this comes to us from some of the Hellenistic doctrines of uh, maltreatment, which is the more harsh aspects that a planet can be involved in. Now, remembering that back in the Hellenistic era, we didn't have the outer planets. Um, we just had Mars and Saturn to cause some concerns. And so some of the more difficult aspects will be aspects that involve either a conjunction, square or opposition with Mars or Saturn. Now, when those aspects are within three degrees, they're particularly poignant and can be very painful. When they're separating outside the three degree mark, that's a good clue that they will indicate some difficult, um, potentially even horrific experiences in childhood that we move beyond. When they're applying, they can both show difficulty in childhood and a particular type of problem or issue that you will want to master and perhaps help other people master as you get older. I'm going to show you an example of that in action. They did allow up to 13 degrees for the moon. So if you're looking at the moon in, in a conjunction, a square or an opposition aspect with Mars or Saturn, you can hold a 13 degree rather than a three degree orb. So just to give you an idea of some of those aspects you want to pay special attention to, as perhaps having triggered or caused some of the more painful experiences of, of your past or of the past of the person you're talking to. Now, I don't want to say that Prince William had a horrible upbringing because he was a prince and he never had to worry about financial security or where his next meal was coming from. But he did have one very specific tragic event in his childhood that while having money certainly would make the experience of losing your mother as a child easier, it will not take away the pain of loss and abandonment that you will go through. And so that's why I'm using his chart today. Um, obviously, he's a white male, so he's had many, many privileges. Um, and his journey with this particular experience is different because of those privileges. But he's done something very specific as a result of the grief that he had, which I do think is, a, is an example of how a chart can work in this particular way. So William is a son in Cancer. He's got a Sag rising. Um, and he was born in that early 80s kind of collection of Mars, Saturn, Pluto in Libra. He was actually born just after an eclipse. And so he has the sun and moon along with the nodes in Cancer there. So the aspect I'm looking at here is the moon square Mars. So to quickly figure out applying versus separating, is the moon or Mars going to be moving faster? It'll be the moon. Is the moon at the same degree or higher than Mars? No, because that would indicate separating. Is the moon at the same degree or lower than Mars? And that's going to indicate applying. 
the moon's at four cancer, Mars at nine Libra. So the moon is at a lower degree uh, in cancer than Mars is in Libra. So this is an applying aspect. Now, moon square Mars aspect, I wanted to mention it because this is a very difficult type of aspect to have. It, it's something that I've only really focused on in the last few years as I've gotten deeper and deeper into traditional astrology. And we often miss it because we're very focused on the outer planet. You can, of course, keep using the outer planet. They've got a lot of useful info to tell us. Uh, but these moon Mars aspects or moon Saturn aspects can also cause a little bit of damage. We need to be aware of them so we don't dismiss our clients' experiences. So moon Mars aspects can show problems with emotional regulation. It can talk about people who are emotionally a little bit volatile or reactive, can be someone who's a bit of a hothead, especially when they're young, which can mean they make sort of extremely impulsive or reckless choices. I'm not saying all of these things relate to Prince William, but I wanted to give you a fullness of how this particular aspect can show up. I see a lot of mums coming to me with their charts of their young children with moon Mars aspects, moon applying to conjunct Mars or square Mars or oppose Mars. And the child is dealing with some very severe tummy, food or digestion issues. So I've learned now to ask people, you know, do you have any food sensitivities or food allergies? Is your digestive system kind of overreactive or do you have infection or inflammation? will often be a story that needs to be dealt with um, around food and how we're taking in nourishment, whether that's just avoiding certain trigger foods or whether there are supplements or certain specific eating protocols that need to go on. And these are all because the moon represents emotions, it represents food, and of course the final thing the moon tends to stand for is our mother. And so the moon to Mars can talk about mum who was volatile herself, um, which actually we know to be true based on what we know about Princess Diana and her own uh, mental health struggles, if you like. Um, but so it can talk about mum who's volatile. It can talk, Mars particularly talks about things getting cut off or cut short. And so moon Mars can talk a little bit about um, an interrupted or disrupted relationship with mum. It could be that mum travels a lot, but in this case, of course, mum actually died when William was a child. And so we see, if you like, some of the pain coming from that. Now, another little tidbit, because uh, this sort of speaks to what, what William has done with this. This is an applying aspect. So he lives with this all his life. And when you're younger and you're in your hot years as a human, which tends to be the teenage years and early 20 years, Mars aspects like this tend to be at their worst because your psychological and physical development is hotter than normal. And of course, Mars is a heating energy. As we get older, our physiology cools down and that can help temper the excess of heat that a moon Mars aspect can indicate. Mars is in detriment here and it is in an air sign in a day chart. So it is a clue of disturbances. Mars is in an air sign and air signs represent the mind. So Mars here is a clue that we have disturbed mind or we have disturbed thinking. Now, in recent years, William has come out and spoken very openly about the mental struggles that he had in the years after his mother's death. And part of the reason that he's done that is that he has obviously felt so passionately about this that he has gone on to set up a mental health initiative in the UK called Heads Together, which is about highlighting the need, particularly for men, to talk about their difficult thoughts or emotions and the idea that we need to put our heads together so that everybody can get the support they need. Recently, he was doing some promotion for his foundation and he was talking with one of the football coaches in the UK. They went to the pub and had a beer, very British thing to do. But they were talking about um, the need for men particularly to talk about their emotions and feelings. Now, one of the reasons I think this is interesting is that someone like Prince William doesn't need to work. He's obviously got loads of money and lots of financial security. But when someone like that chooses to put their, and, and I know they have to do something, but I think it's interesting what they choose to do. Now, to just flesh this out a little further, in William's chart, Mars is actually one of his career planets because it rules his Scorpio midheaven. And so we sort of see this aspect as having an impact on his career and life direction. And he, this is an example of um, moving through the trauma and the pain that he experienced from this applying aspect 
and offering that back out into the world as some sort of solution or support or service to other people who might be struggling with their mental health as well. So just an example there of how we can move beyond the limitations of some of our aspects. Now, I know we've got just a few minutes left, so I'm just going to, I obviously always have far too many examples in these presentations. So I'm just thinking about which I might very briefly, no, I'm just thinking which chart should we talk about. I want to talk about Oprah, I think, um, before we get to our summary at the end. Um, of course, you know, I can bang on for hours, but you've got a whole wonderful lineup of summit speakers who also have some wonderful insight to offer you. Now, Oprah has an example of an applying aspect as well that we can see that she turned to her advantage. So she is an Aquarius here, Sun in Aquarius, and she's got Saturn in Scorpio. So she's got this very tight applying square. The Sun is going to move faster than Saturn. And so the Sun at 8.59 Aquarius is almost exactly square Saturn at 9 degrees Scorpio, 2 minutes. Now, Oprah is a great example of someone who has come from poverty and absolutely, you know, skyrocketed through glass ceiling after glass ceiling that on paper, no one would believe a young black girl from the South would even be able to know that there was a glass ceiling there and she has smashed them. But Oprah, if you don't know, was born in poverty in rural Mississippi and her mother was a teenager, a single mother. That Oprah was born after a one night stand and the couple didn't stay together. Oprah lived with her grandmother until she was about six years old. Her grandmother supported her, but her grandmother was very hard on her and also physically abused her. Um, after that stage, they moved around a bit. Um, Oprah lived at various points. Um, no one really knows who um, Oprah's dad is. Oprah may know and she may not have actually said, but she lived with a gentleman who she referred to as her dad off and on through her childhood. But unfortunately, Oprah, like Maya, was abused and molested in her childhood. Uh, then Oprah became pregnant at the age of 14 and the baby was born prematurely and uh, died shortly after birth. So this is a very restricted, limited, impoverished start to life. And I think here we're sort of seeing the pressure, if you like, of that Saturn, almost like pushing down on that sun in Aquarius to say, you know, like, here is some limitation or here are problems, here are restrictions, you're going to have to suffer. Saturn is making this aspect from the sign of Scorpio, um, which can certainly trigger difficult emotions, and also from its place in the 12th house, which is a house associated with suffering. But somewhere through that mid-teens period, things shifted for Oprah. She did actually move back in with the man who she identifies as her father. And as a result of his support, did very well in high school. So she applied herself instead of if you like being broken by the experiences that she had been through, she somehow was able to draw on some of that inner fortitude or strength that Saturn can bestow on an individual, the resilience, if you like. She won a scholarship um, and she, through her college years, she was actually reading the local news on the local radio station. So she, within this kind of seven year period in her teenage years, went from being abused, having a baby, to reading the news on the local radio station, which then led very quickly to a talk show, well, a news bulletin show that then turned into a talk show. So that by the time she had her first Saturn return, the Saturn was coming back to its place in Scorpio, she had her own talk show, the Oprah Winfrey Show. Now, keep in mind, Oprah was a young black girl in Chicago in the 80s, getting jobs that maybe technically should have been, you know, people would have thought they might have gone to a white girl or to a white man. And she was so good with her communication and her language skills. She had a, a different style from what was on the air at the time, but people loved it. Well, you can see that strong third house there coming in for Oprah. So she drew on those communication skills and that never say die attitude that Saturn can give. And so she was able to turn the problems of that sun squat, Saturn square um, almost up. By the time Saturn um, made the opposition in her chart, 
um, the age of 14, it's like she was moving beyond the problematic manifestation of that and starting to do the work and see some results herself. So, of course, we could go on about this wonderful, exciting topic all day, but I'm hoping at this point you've started to get a sense of the power of revisioning the way you look at aspects, of connecting that idea of movement back into your birth chart, if you like, as a way of breathing life into the chart to bring, bring it back to life. Imagine the planets like it's a 3D chess model or something and this planet's moving here and that planet's moving there. That can help you understand which aspects have this intensity. The applying aspects are those most intense aspects that are going to be repeated and reactivated throughout your life. And those are the aspects you really want to focus on working, if you like. How can I master what this aspect has to say about me as a person so that I can take the positive attributes and be productive with this in my life going forward? And then identify some of those separating aspects that you can really clarify if they are giving you a gift or giving you a problem that that's a problem or a gift that hopefully you've, you've sorted out by the time you've had your first Saturn return so that you can turn your energy to the applying aspects, which is where the bulk of the action is going to be moving forward for you. Now, the whole reason and intention behind this, besides technically bringing breath and life back to your chart, helping you go deeper with aspects, which is so important, the more you know about aspects, the better all of your astrology will be, whether you're doing natal chart, predictive, relationship, health, financial, mundane astrology, understanding this extra piece of information about movement in aspects just gives you an extra key to unlock potential. And this Leonard Cohen quote is what I wanted to finish on today. It kind of spoke to some of the material I was presenting today, but also to the whole summer theme, which are about breakthroughs and transformation. The key here um, is to help you know yourself, to understand the fullness of your experience. And I'm just going to read this Leonard Cohen quote to finish because it really speaks to me about my broken places and it may help you as well. It says, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. And so even if you do have some difficult aspects in your chart, I know I have goosebumps when I read that quote, the difficult aspects show the cracks and the places where the light gets in. And that's where you have something magical that you can blossom through and then offer out into the world.